we said that the, the original internet protocols didn't support security, so people have created some add-ons and they can be used at different layers in our protocol stack. We can have the add-ons inside the application, so add the encryption to the application, so it encrypts the data as it generates it, or inside the operating system. So the operating system does the encryption and there's two modes really. The inside the transport layer, using an extension of the transport layer, and a common one is called TLS, but also called SSL. So don't get confused when I say TLS or SSL, I generally mean the same thing. They just, uh, uh, it was originally called SSL, but uh, as the versions changed, it became TLS. But in this context, we mean the same. So at the transport level or at the network layer level, that is encrypt the IP datagram, or at least the data inside the datagram using IPsec. Or the fourth case, which we finished on last week, was at the link level. Use the link technology to encrypt. And different link technologies support encryption, especially wireless. And we went through, using this example, uh, uh, topology and protocol stacks to show that with application level security we get end-to-end -end encryption but we must as the application developer deal with that security those security mechanisms so there's some complexity for, for the application developer some systems support that so secure shell is one that you've used on a regular basis but there are others as well or at the transport level, where the application developer doesn't have to worry about the implementing encryption and other security mechanisms. They use a library, usually, that comes with your operating system or comes with an application. And that library usually implements TLS or SSL. One such library, OpenSSL. But it only works for one transport protocol. So it's not as uh, generic as some of the others but still end-to-end -end encryption, which is good. HTTPS is the best known example of that. HTTPS simply is normal HTTP using TLS. Then we said at the network layer there's IPsec, also can provide end-to-end -end encryption, which is good, and it encrypts everything, whether it's UDP or TCP, whatever the d transport protocol is being used, the data is sent to IP and then IPsec encrypts that. So it doesn't matter which transport protocol we're using, it doesn't matter which application layer protocol we're using. If it's HTTP traffic, email, instant messaging, it still can be encrypted with IPsec. So it's the most general of the three solutions. So that's good. It's good because it can be end-to-end it's bad, or the problem with it is that it often involves the end user on the host where we run IPsec, host A and host B, to do some configuration, set up uh, the, the security parameters so that they can communicate between the hosts. So that makes it not very convenient for many common applications. So it's not widely used in this mode. We did look at also Wi-Fi encryption. We looked at the case where we could use encryption just across a link. Good as it encrypts everything, whether it's UDP or TCP, IP version 4, IP version 6, doesn't matter. It's encrypted as it's sent by the network device. The problem is it only applies to that single link. It doesn't give us end-to-end -end security, so it only has limited uh, purpose. So they're the four main solutions, but we said IPsec is not so common used for this end-to-end -end encryption, but it is uh, slightly more common for other setups. And we saw when you look in your mobile phone under the VPN settings, there is an option to use IPsec. And that's where IPsec and some other technologies are used. And we'll show them in the next couple of slides and the next topic will return to this issue of, of VPNs. So we say that 
Network level security, IPsec and even others, is commonly used in what we say tunneling mode. What does tunneling mode mean? Change the proxy. Have you covered it in maybe Dr. Comwood's course? Maybe, maybe not. We'll define it, but we'll, uh, you, you've seen tunnels talked about. We'll, we'll define it shortly. Uh, but first, let's look at an example, and it'll make it reasonably clear, I hope. Here's our same topology as before. But in this example, we're going to use IPsec on my host, my computer, my laptop, for example. And instead of it having a running on host B, we'll run IPsec as another endpoint, let's say on router Y. So the idea here is that when my host A sends its IP datagrams, IPsec will encrypt the data. But instead of sending it encrypted all the way through to host B, we send it encrypted all the way through to router Y. Router Y, which is running IPsec, decrypts what it receives and then takes that plain text data and sends it normally to the final destination host B. So the red line highlights the the path for which the data is encrypted using IPsec. First thing I think you will note, we don't have end-to-end -end encryption. Between host A and host B, the entire path does not use encryption. And that's a disadvantage here, because if an attacker intercepts the traffic between router Y and host B, the, the traffic is not encrypted, so that's a, a, a security flaw. It's only encrypted from the router to host A. Why would we do this then? As opposed to the previous version of, or application of IPsec where we had it from host to host. Why would we run IPsec from host to router? If it gives us less security, what advantage does it give us? What's the pro what was the problem with IPsec? Again? What, what, what did we say the problem was? Have a look on the slides, it may say. That is, in the end-to-end -end application of IPsec, it's good from a security perspective because we have encryption all the way. What's the problem with it? It usually requires some manual su or some support. The IPsec features need to be available and some manual configuration in the endpoints, in the hosts. So if that's the case, where IPsec is used, there's some manual configuration necessary. How can this case, host to router application of IPsec, be better than the previous one? What's the advantage here? The, u the user at the recipient, host B's endpoint, doesn't need to configure IPsec. The administrator of the router needs to configure IPsec, but not the user of host B. Well, does that make much difference? It does if there are many hosts inside this subnet. Let's say router Y is the router for, for SIIT and the hosts inside SIT, there are hundreds, if not thousands. So we don't need to configure IPsec on every individual host inside the subnet. We configure IPsec on the one router for SIT. And the, external, well, the host A in this case, yes, we still need to configure IPsec here, but internal or the, the destination network, it's much simpler. It's just on one device that covers the entire network. So that's the, the trade-off that arises in this approach. We no longer have end-to-end -end encryption. We have a, a potential area of compromise between router and host B. That's a negative. 
But the advantage is that we no longer need to configure IPsec on every individual host inside this network. We can configure it once on the router. It doesn't have to be done by you or the end user. It's done by the network administrator who should have more knowledge of how to set it up correctly. And in many practical cases, encrypting from host A through to the router may be secure enough. Because often, let's say the router is that for SIT, often we may trust the network internally. So all the traffic between the SIT router and the SIT hosts, like my office computer and so on, we assume an attacker cannot intercept that. Because they must come into SIT and, and physically access our cables to intercept. So we consider this portion of the, the path from Y to B more secure. But from SIT's perspective, outside of router Y, that is out on the internet, we don't trust. Therefore we use encryption across that part of the path. And that's where uh, IPsec has a larger, larger role in being used in the internet. And not just IPsec, there are other protocols that do similar. How, how is it done? So that's the advantage here, uh, but how is it achieved? Uh, I try to capture with these uh, packets, so I'll not draw them again. Slightly different from what I drew before, but just to make the packets easier or quicker to draw, this is the IP datagram. This is the data, and the source address is A, and the destination address is B. All right, we're sending from host A to host B. So this is what the IP datagram originally looks like, from A to B and some data inside, whether it's TCP, uh, UDP, or some, uh, or doesn't matter what application. But what IPsec does, when we've configured it in this mode, is it takes that original IP datagram encrypts it all and puts another IP header on the outside. And we see that down the bottom. The original IP datagram going from A to B and the data is all encrypted. But an additional IP header is attached and the source IP address is A and the destination is router Y, the endpoint of the IPsec security connection. As a result, we send this datagram. It's still an IP datagram with a normal IP header. We send it through the internet via our Wi-Fi. Someone intercepts it over my home Wi-Fi network. What do they see? Well, they don't see my data. They see it's going from A to Y. They don't see the transport layer because it's encrypted, so they don't know if I'm using HTTP or some other protocol. They do know A and Y are communicating. And as it goes through the internet, similar. Someone on the internet that intercepts cannot see the data. They cannot see it's destined to B, but they can see it's destined to Y in the outer header. This datagram gets to router Y, which is the other endpoint of the IPsec connection. And as the endpoint, what it does is it removes, because it's the destination Y, it removes the outer header, decrypts the inner part, and what do we get? We get the original IP datagram and send that on to B. So as Y receives this encrypted IP datagram, it realizes I'm the destination, we're using IPsec. Actually inside the header there's something that indicates we're using IPsec. We decrypt the data and find that it's another IP datagram. And the destination is B. So we forward that datagram onto B who receives that uh, original datagram.
So that's the, the basics of the how we send over a portion of the path encrypted, in this case from host A to router Y. Questions on how at this stage? It's a very important uh, technology and you'll probably use it, if not have, in, in the future. Everything okay at the back? Okay. Again. The end. All right. So a question about the end-to-end -end encryption. First, is this case end-to-end -end encryption? What do I mean by end-to-end? Well, in this case, we're talking about host A wants to communicate with host B. So host A is one endpoint, host B is the other endpoint. So this case on the screen is not using end-to-end -end encryption because we don't have the data encrypted all the way between the two endpoints. So this is not end-to-end -end encryption and, and that's a negative in this case, a disadvantage. This one is end-to-end -end encryption. We encrypt at the source endpoint, send the data encrypted all the way across the path and decrypt at the recipient endpoint. That's what we'd like in most cases. And that's what TLS provided and even application level security. Because we don't want anyone in the entire path to be able to intercept. But with the IPsec setup, there's a disadvantage of end to end encryption. We must configure the endpoints to support IPsec. So, in this case, where we don't have end to end encryption, we lose some security because we don't have encryption across the last segment in the path, but we gain some convenience because we don't need to set up IPsec on all the in hosts here, let's say all the hosts inside SIT, we only need to set it up on one router. So that's the trade-off there. If we don't have end-to-end -end encryption, it means we're going to have to trust someone in the path. Here we trust whoever operates the network between router Y and host B. Maybe it's your home and you trust that no one can access your home and, and access your network, maybe that's satisfactory. Or maybe it's an organisation where you work for and they've secured their network using other means. So this may be suitable. The way that we implemented this, by taking the original IP datagram destined to be, putting it inside another IP datagram. There's really two IP headers here. One that says the source is A and the destination is B, and the outer header, so there's an inner header and an outer header from A to Y. This concept of putting one IP datagram inside another what do we call it? It's generally referred to as tunneling. So that's what we mean by tunneling. Carry one datagram of using IP inside another IP datagram. So this is an example of tunneling. The concept is we've, we're sending from A to B, but we send it via a tunnel from A through to Y. This setup may be used, uh, again, back to the example, the network from Y to B, let's say, is SIT's internal network. And host A is my laptop at home. As an employee of SIT, I sometimes need to access the internal network from home to access some special servers, the database servers and the uh, servers inside SIT. So we may use this setup in that 
from my host A through to the SIT network basically is the public internet. And we don't trust that. So all of our communications between host A and the router Y should be secure. So we use a tunnel, in this case an IPsec tunnel, between them. But we trust the SIT network, uh, so we don't need the setup on the internal network. In practice, to set this up, the router Y needs to be configured to support IPsec, and it's often referred to as a tunnel endpoint or a VPN endpoint, a virtual private network endpoint. And so that would be set up to allow any employee from SIT from their external computer to connect into the router. This would require some setup on my laptop maybe some software installed or set up the operating system so that I know that the endpoint is router Y. Open your mobile phones again. Some have got them open. They're very fast at doing this. Well done. Go to the VPN settings and find IPsec or just the general VPN settings on your phone. Where is it? You find it and tell me. What, what are some of the settings? Yeah, the VPN settings. So you can choose the different protocols. One is PPTP. Is there another one? IPsec. Choose IPsec. Choose IPsec. And there are different versions or different variations you need to choose something about the keys but address if you find under ipsec settings you'll see that you need to specify the server address in your phone so what your phone is like host a what you do on your phone is you set up the ipsec settings or the vpn settings in general to say that my server is router y and you set the other security settings so that now, when you use your phone, whenever it sends in anything across the internet, an IP datagram is created, a normal one, and then it's sent to the IPsec software on your phone, which then encrypts it and sends it, using tunneling, through to router Y. Router Y receives it, decrypts, and forwards that original IP datagram to the destination, whether it's host B or someone else. So that's what the, the VPN settings are used for on your phone, where your phone can create a secure connection to some intermediate server, a VPN server. What can an attacker learn if they're in the internet, in this internet portion of our path? What can they learn? the address of the source and destination, more specific now because we have a few addresses in here. Right, uh, if you look in the outer header, they can address, learn the address of the original host, host A, and of the router. So they know I'm communicating with this router. For example, they know if they can identify my IP address corresponds to Steve, they know Steve is communicating with the SIT router. But they don't know which internal host SI inside SIT that I'm communicating to. They don't know if it's B or C or someone else. So that's some extra feature that we obtain using this service. We hide the final destination. Here's a variation. In this first approach, the end user must set up the IPsec security connections uh, uh, configuration on their device. You must set it into your phone or your laptop or your, your PC. Again, that may be too inconvenient sometimes. Here's another case. Let's say... Uh, on the left, to the left of router X, is one office, one campus, for example. 
and to the right of router Y is another office or another campus and in between the two routers is the public internet so on the left maybe Rungsit, on the right is uh, Bunkeri and in, in the middle is just the public internet we use some internet service providers to communicate between campuses so in this case at the two routers at the edge of the two campuses router X and Y we set up IPsec again we trust the internal communications I trust when I send something inside my campus it will be secure no one's going to intercept I trust all the students so we don't worry about security across the path from A to router X similar at the other campus from host B to router Y we trust that network we don't worry about encryption there but we don't trust anyone in the public internet so what we do is we set up our two edge routers to use IPsec. When A sends a datagram to B, here's the datagram, source address A, destination B, the original datagram, it goes through, eventually gets to router X, that's the path it takes. Router X realises anything that's going out of me, I need to use IPsec and send it to router Y. So it takes that datagram, encrypts it all and puts it inside another IP datagram. The outer header says the source is X, the destination is Y. So this datagram is sent across the internet, goes to router Y. Router Y is the endpoint of the tunnel and it ex removes the outer header decrypts the internal datagram and sees, ah, I have something from A to B, let's forward it on to B, and B gets the data. So this is another application, still using tunneling, and another approach of using IPsec. What's the uh, advantage of this compared to the previous one? An advantage. Why is this approach good? What do we gain from doing this compared to the previous one? Or what do we lose? What's the disadvantage? Compare this one versus this. What do we lose? Well, we lose some security over some portion of the path. Here we had encryption from A all the way through to Y. Here we only have it from X through to Y. So we've lo lost some uh, security from A through to Y. Maybe that's not a problem if we trust this internal network. What do we gain? Convenience. Convenience because of... we don't need or the end user doesn't need to set up their host to support IPsec you don't have to configure your phone the SIT router is configured to encrypt everything that it gets so the the network administrator sets up the two routers to use IPsec the end users do nothing and therefore it's very easy for end users they, they don't have to care about their VPN settings or security certificates and so on so that's the advantage of this approach. Again, it's using tunneling. We put one packet inside the other of the same type and encrypting that. And the other name of that is a virtual private network, a VPN. The internet we call a public network. Many people own parts of the internet it, or uh, operate different parts of it. So we don't trust the internet generally. It's a public network. But by encrypting the data and sending it across that public network, no one can see the data. It's as if the data is now private for us. No one can see it, see it. it's private. So we have a private network between X and Y. Well, it's not a true private network. A, pr a true private network is if I own all the cables. All right. So not very convenient. We get a virtual private network 
the same level of security as if I owned all, this, all the cables because still no one can see the data. Hence we call this a virtual private network, a VPN between X and Y. And we may refer to X and Y as VPN endpoints or tunnel endpoints. This case is also a virtual private network but from A through to Y, a VPN. And sometimes we'd refer to Y, or in this case X as well, as a VPN server, a VPN endpoint. Which direction am I going? This one. So that, uh, this summarizes what we've said so far. Tunneling is putting packets of one protocol type into the same at the same layer at least. So putting our IP packet from the network layer into another IP packet at the network layer is referred to as tunneling. There are other types of tunneling and it's commonly used for security. We encrypt data. We can do tunneling using secure shell. That is I can access a website using HTTP but those HTTP messages are sent using a secure shell connection. We may see that next week. And I think you noticed on your phone when you look at the VPN settings, you usually have three different options. There's IPsec, PPTP, and L2TP. They are three common VPN protocols. And it depends upon the network operator as to which one's supported. Most operating systems of end user devices will support all three, not all, uh, but the, the organizations like SIT, the router and so on may not support all three. And we use tunneling when we encrypt the data to create a virtual private network. PPTP, I think, is the point-to-point -point tunneling protocol, and L2TP is the layer two tunneling protocol. We can have the advantage of configuring the security mechanisms on the routers rather than the end hosts, but the disadvantage is we don't get end-to-end -end encryption. Last one here. In this case, we say we trust the internal network. Let's say router Y to host B is uh, at Rungsit, and A to X is here at Bunker D. Where's a problem in this case? Where many problems. What's a problem? What, what don't you trust? What's the weakest point, you think, in this case? There's too many links between host A and router X. Well, let's think about that. Host A is my laptop. There's a link to the Wi-Fi access point on the wall. That has a cable going down to the third floor, uh, second floor in this building, and that's where the computer center is, and there's a router there, and that router is router X. So maybe in the best case, there's one wireless link from me to the access point, and then one cable from that access point to the router. There's probably a switch or two in between in practice. Do we trust that? No? Why not? Let's say I trust the users inside SIT. I trust the other faculty members, staff. I trust the students. All right. I don't, don't worry. But let's say we worked in a company and we trust all the other employers, employees. So what would be the problem still in this case? Still inside this, right, at host B, is there a problem? This is our other office. So let's say we have a company now, two offices, one in, at, in different cities. So from A to X is one office. We trust all the other workers in that office. And from Y to B is another office in another city, and we trust the workers there, same company. 
So where's the weak point? Where's the weak point then? There is a weak point. We trust the workers, so I don't expect someone to come into my Ethernet cable and, and cut it and, and tap into it. Because I, if you don't work for us, you have to get into the building and we have security. You can't get past security. So still, what's the weak point here? We have security to stop people from getting into the building and tapping into my Ethernet network, but someone can sit outside of the building in their car and capture my Wi-Fi packets. Because of the nature of wireless, when we transmit, our packets don't just go across a single link, they go, they're broadcast in all directions. When I transmit from my laptop to the access point on the wall, trans the signals are going outside as well. So someone can be sitting outside listening into my Wi-Fi traffic. So the weakness here is this wireless LAN link. How can we overcome that? Without having to lose the benefits of using the VPN from router A to router Y? How do we overcome the weakness of the wireless LAN link? Log in or use some link level encryption just across the Wi-Fi link. Use WPA, for example, for the Wi-Fi link. We trust the wired links. We use WPA across the wireless link. And across the public internet, we use our IPsec-based virtual private network. So we must make a trade-off between uh, providing high security encrypting as much as possible versus making it convenient for the users and administrators. A VPN makes it very convenient, but we lose some security. We may use a combination of link level encryption across the wireless portion, a VPN across the public internet as a trade-off. Of course, I don't trust the students in SIT, so even if we do have a, a VPN, I'm going to be using HTTPS for uh, transport lag encryption to log into websites and so on. So we can have a combination of these security mechanisms. It's not just one of them. Any questions on virtual private networks so far. And especially these two cases of using IPsec. We can use L2TP and PPTP, these other alternatives, in a similar manner as IPsec. That brings us to the end of these slides. So, well, no. There is some slides about secure email. We're not going to touch them. We're going to continue on this topic of internet security, but uh, we're going to look at it from a different perspective. Coming back to our VPN. Uh, where? Yeah, the VPN. Maybe not the VPN. We'll come back to one of our earlier ones, even. Say when we used HTTPS, which is using TLS. One more, not that one. This one. This was our example when we used TLS, Transport Layer Security. This was the packet down the bottom that was sent across the red line, across our wireless LAN, Ethernet, and the public internet. Someone intercepts this packet. They're out in the public internet. What do they learn? When someone intercepts this packet, what do they learn about the communications? They know the source and destination. So they know A is talking to B. Anything else? 
They know they're talking using TCP, and inside the TCP header will be the port number, so they probably can work out what application they're using. They can't learn the data. So that's the main thing we want to protect, usually, the data. But they can learn some things. And especially who is communicating. Sometimes we would like to hide that. Who is communicating? Because if someone can observe the, the entities communicating and how often they communicate and what patterns of communications, that can reveal valuable information sometimes. So in addition to trying to keep the data confidential, sometimes we'd like to keep the identities of those communicating confidential. HTTPS doesn't do that because someone can see it's still A talking to B. And similar application level security didn't do that. It was still identified as A and B. Using IPsec in end-to-end -end mode doesn't hide who is communicating. It's still A talking to B. But with a VPN, someone intercepts on the public internet. What do they learn about who is communicating? A to Y. What does that tell them? Anything useful? It still can be useful for them. Why? Well, they learn about why. Let's say A is my laptop at home. All right, so they know it's me. We'll talk about how they can map the address. It's an IP address back to me in a moment. And the network from Y to B is the SIT internal network. So B is a server. And why is the router of SIT? So with this VPN solution, someone, they know it's A talking to Y. They don't know they're talking to B. So they don't know I'm talking to this specific server, but they do know I'm talking to someone in SIT. So they, by using a VPN, we've hidden some information, but we still reveal a lot. We reveal the, the user A and we reveal the destination network. And that may be sufficient for an attacker to learn something about who's communicating. To know that uh, I'm communicating with SIT may be valuable for them. So we'd like more security than that sometimes. Can we hide the source and destination completely? That's one aspect of internet privacy. This one, does it help? A little bit. Again, the attacker on the internet doesn't know it's A and B. They know it's X and Y. But still, Y may represent SIT. X may represent my home network. They can't map it back to the individual computer A, but they can map it back to the network of A. So again, can we hide that? Can we make it so that they cannot learn who is communicating? And that's the next topic on internet privacy.